Hi, and welcome to the ninth episode of Speak Up by Smiling Movement. Today, we're going to be talking with our amazing guests about how we can make the world more trans inclusive. So thank you, everybody, for joining me today. It's really lovely to have you here, um, even though it's really warming <laughs> but we move um so just to kind of kick us off i just kind of want to open to everybody and feel free to interact with each other as well how do you think i guess just to set a barometer of where we are now how do you think the world is doing today at being trans inclusive hmm. <laughs> okay how do i think the how do we think the world is being today at being trans inclusive i think the world is doing what it's good at doing and talking about things that they need to talk about, but not necessarily doing it because the doing of it would also mean letting go of the systems that we uphold as things that are tried and true. Um, like the idea of gender, gender identity, and you know, assigning sex at birth and all of these things. Like if the world was more trans inclusive those kinds of things would be being spoken about and also slowly being done away with. Um, so I think at its core, um, the world is just doing what the world does and it's having conversations and the people who want to see change are the ones that are going to be making it, who are making it. All of us on this couch are making change in some way. Yeah, um, you can definitely say that. But yeah, I I don't think the world is doing too too well at that at the moment. That's my personal opinion. No, that's good. But you hate. Yeah, I mean, first the world's a huge place and like <laughs> I I've lived in a few different places before moving here to London and I would say in general the the state is terrible. Um, and it's funny because when I moved here just a year ago, a lot of people would say, why did you move here? And I would say one of the reasons is that it's more trans and non-binary friendly. And everyone here would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, my day-to-day -day life is terrible. Um, and so, yeah, I think it, you know, the overall state of the world, like we can't forget, is in a terrible place. You know, they're not even talking about um, the idea of trans people existing. I mean, there are people here denying trans people exist in, in the UK, but there are people, you know, who, I mean, other parts of the world that are in a very different place. And I think that's important to remember. Um, and while also recognizing that just because there's progress here doesn't mean we should be grateful, um, like purely grateful at least. And in the sense of, I do see that, you know, in a lot of places we're in this really tough place, potentially worse, where we're, we're suggesting that people can come out and, and trying to, to, um, like, I don't know, build this idea of inclusion while denying people any of the actual, you know, access and rights and medical care that they need, um, which is for many people, I think, uh, a more trying experience. Um, so I think that's, that's the state. Yeah. <laughs> Marty. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all, all you're both saying. I, I think what's interesting to me is we've had where people are very aware of trans people mm. in 2024. So awareness isn't the issue, mm. but they're aware of trans people largely through distorted, um, a distorted lens. Mm. Uh, and a lot of disinformation about our community and a lot of focus on issues that are not trans issues, mm. right? I think that's the, that's the biggest thing for me is that, um, I think we need to move from awareness to agency mm. and we don't have that yet, right? We don't have political power, we don't have trans MPs, we don't have um, trans journalists in big media titles, we don't have that agency. Mm. Um, so where are, where's the world in terms of trans inclusion? I'd like to see more agency and um, yeah, with the 0.5% of the population, mm -hmm. which we are, if you go by the UK census anyway, which I think is an underestimate, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we need allies to help open those doors and lift up the mics and pass them to us so that we can advocate for ourselves. And that is the next wave of mm -hmm. inclusion that we need to see because we're rolling back, you know, hate crimes going up, our healthcare is under attack, you know, housing is not great, 
the, the three H's, as Olivia Campbell Cavendish, my, my good friend who runs the Translegal Clinic, says, the three H's, healthcare, housing, and hate crime, those are trans issues. Mm. And those aren't the conversations we're talking about. In the zeitgeist, trans issues seems to be women's sports and toilets. Mm. These are not trans issues. I guess what I'm hearing sort of like collectively is that we need a little bit more action and a little less, I guess, ephemerate awareness building. Um, we need a little bit more solid movement and change from people within power, opening up mm -hmm. access for voices, I guess. Yeah, I think I think that's it's I think that's very needed. I think with every with every conversation we have, there should be uh, there should be something that we're doing to move forward. You know, there should be something that we're actually trying to action and achieve. If we're just having conversations, and when I say we're, if we're just having conversations, I'm not talking about trans people or non-binary people or queer people just having conversations because we're out here actually trying to change the situation for ourselves, right? But just because, oh, there's some trans questions, trans focused questions on like question time or whatever, doesn't mean that we're moving forward. You're talking about us, great. You're talking about us in a way that we don't even really identify with. And while you're doing that, you're making other people uncomfortable with the fact that we exist. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that it doesn't really make any sense. Mm -hmm. Like what actually should be happening is if you're going to talk about us, you're then also then going, you're then going to go forward and educate people on mm -hmm. us as well. You know, I think that, I think there's so much in education. And when I say education, I don't just mean in schools. I think in actually just educating people and actually just saying, hey, this is what's happening here. I don't remember the last time that I heard, you know, hate crimes against trans people being accurately spoken about. When we talk about hate crimes against trans people, when and when we're talking about it in media, oh my God, this is so bad. These trans people were attacked, right? And that's like fine if we actually live in a, a society where trans people, I feel, are valued as actual people, but in a society that consistently dehumanizes us, to say these trans people were attacked, that's so bad, means nothing. Mm. Because to other people who think that we are the bathroom stalking, you know, whatever they want to call it, to those people, they're like, good, mm. good that they're being attacked because I don't want them around. And like, where is, where, where is our humanity in all of this? I'd also add to that dark word about you know, it's even from well-meaning allies, because when you've got this pervasiveness that we're dehumanized and this kind of narrative that we're dehumanized, it soaks into trans people, right? And our sense of well-being, it soaks into our allies as well. And that's where you get sentiment, which sort of is a framing that trans is a tragic condition to mm. be, right? And that leads to then sympathies and like, you know, you hear politicians when they even when they're talking good about us, um, they talk about us being a vulnerable part of society and this, you know, we're made vulnerable by the conditions we live in, which is this cis-normative society. Mm -hmm. We're not mm. inherently tragic no. for being trans. No. It, trans is beautiful, right? Tra trans is joyful. Trans is beautiful. Trans is inspiring. Like being, I mean, listen, there are so many people walking around in so many different looks or garments or in, in inspirations that come from the simple existence of our people. Mm. You know, like I remember watching, I actually interviewed D Squared about this uh, runway when they had loads of like feminine uh, clothing. I'm, I'm gonna say feminine clothing because that's how it was, it was uh, mm. framed at the time um, on masculine or male models and also showing different body types on male models that would also be seen as a little bit more feminine. I'm like, oh, cute. I love that we can do that on the runway mm -hmm. when we're trying to sell it to people who have enough money to buy into our aesthetic and also tune out of what's actually happening with us. Mm -hmm. But like, it would be nice to feel respected for that. It would be nice to walk down the street dressed the way that we choose to dress because that's how we experience gender euphoria 
and not feel attacked for it and then three weeks later see it as like mm. some big brand's campaign and this 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 thing this little bit that i'm speaking about right now is one bit that incenses me mm. because there are so many fashion editors photographers stylists art directors who are queer who are part of the community mm. who could be doing so much more than just during June and July, let's get some trans girls and trans men in and let's put them on the cover of Vogue because like now we care about it. And that's not that's not disparaging that um, publication. I was just saying because it's one of the biggest publications in the world. And to consistently have people put forward in a light that is not tragic, in a light mm -hmm. that is not oh woe is them oh you know they need help no no, no, no. listen we're we're good we're doing the things that we need to do we it's not help that we need it's for people to understand that we are people mm. that's really where i think it is but what is interesting what we're seeing now and i'd like to hear your perspective on this as well yeah. from like pride in london is there's a real silencing around brands uh, brands are not involving trans people in their campaigns mm. this year there's been a real quietness from marketeers. There's been, you know, the pride briefs have not been coming to the agencies. Mm -hmm. I work in advertising agency. I, I work as the joint CEO of advertising, which is the um, advertising and marketing industry's queer advocacy organization. And there's been a real silence in this year. So, you know, what you're saying, Dark Horror, about, you know, this performative use of us and our aesthetic and our stories. Um, now we're seeing a complete rollback because mm -hmm. it was built on shaky foundations. Mm -hmm. So how do we build that representation back authentically with stronger foundations? And so, for example, E45 have done a really great campaign. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to the people involved in that, the marketers, the agencies, and that has genuinely had an impact in society and that they did a review of skincare um, that has been... Um, it's kind of a systematic review. It's been recognized um, globally by WPATH and that will help trans people globally, right? To understand how their skin changes through transition. And they're also weathering backlash. They are kind of, they have a plan for backlash, which you inevitably get when you work with trans people in groups. Mm. So I wanna see, I wanna see that representation return, but I wanna see it return with substance. Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah, and it's interesting talking yeah. from a Pride in London perspective, works with a lot of corporates, a lot of brands. Yeah. yeah. Your perspective on what you're seeing. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, there's this broader, like, issue we're seeing, I think, you know, more so in the US, but all over the world, of like this pullback of, of corporates and brands that are scared of backlash, mm -hmm. scared to, to stand up for anything, or even telling their their companies like, you know, you, you can't talk about anything but work on on work platforms or work premises, and it is really a a, a silencing of mm -hmm. people simply expressing themselves for who they are and what matters to them and what their lives are like. Um, and I think that's an issue that you know we need to hold corporations and and brands accountable for the people in those corporations because brands are not, you know, amorphous. They are individuals who are making decisions. Mm -hmm. They are leaders who are making decisions. And um, I think this is where, you know, I think there's a lot of like um, challenges in like how much do we work with with corporations for any organization I think any any movement um, and the question is how can you can you move them enough for it to be worth it um, can you you know do something you know keeping in mind that corporations again are, are people you hold the leaders accountable but you think about the employees and what their lives are like and whether or not their you know health insurance covers what they need mm. um, they're not again like amorphous entities mm. um, and so thinking about that, um, what kind of change can be done? I, I do, I mean, you know, I, this is kind of a general statement, but yeah, I think we are seeing that slide back. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, you know, will leaning in mm. help? Um, and can we can we pull them back? And can there, can the people in these companies, employees, I talk to a lot of people in the ERGs, and they really are trying their best to, to you know, hold the, hold the line on some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is, that is a huge challenge. Um, and 
And I just want to say one more thing because I think you started a question of talking about awareness, and I think what we're all saying it sounds like is, you know, awareness is a vague word, and simply, you know, existing, even being represented in marketing campaigns, right?、Um, being talked about, being in a discourse, being entertainment, being like、um, some in some slices of culture that are somehow、mm-hmm. for where it's acceptable to be、um, more different.、Um, That's not that's not awareness,、mm. right? When we say awareness, we mean awareness of the real people、mm. and、yeah. their real like thoughts and feelings and and needs.、Um, I do hear this sentiment as well from from people in the trans community that awareness is dangerous. Actually,、mm-hmm. now awareness is compromising our safety. People are more aware of trans people. I'm more、um, prone to violence in the street as a、mm-hmm. result. And the idea that the solution.、Mm. To to this is erasure in media、mm-hmm. is really worrisome for me. So the idea that some people have in our community that awareness is dangerous and therefore let's not have it,、um, I think for me that that perspective is wrong. But I can understand、yeah. where that feeling comes from. It's not the awareness that's wrong. It's the stories mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and our agency in telling those stories. Right?、Um, we don't have that. We don't have that right now. So I guess, sort of, what I'm hearing, and I, I, I guess you'll notice I'm trying to stay quite quiet because obviously I'm not trans, and so I'm wanting to let you guys talk and just sort of be a, a listener and a guide. But what I sort of heard from that was that maybe awareness isn't necessarily wrong, but awareness can't be the only thing that、mm. that we're doing in this, and it, it can't stand、mm-hmm. on its own because. Awareness not, isn't going to、yeah. do the job. It's awareness of the right types of things too,、mm. right? I think like awareness that, you know,、um, I don't know, awareness that trans people exist, right? Sorry, <laughs>、uh, awareness trans people exist, or awareness that, you know,、um, I feel、Always、like that existed as well. Yeah,、mm-hmm. you know? yeah, exactly.、Um, which is not something that people are aware of,、no. right?、Um, awareness of weird selective, like selective awareness, I should say,、mm. of. Like medical information, selective awareness、mm-hmm. of、um, you know what our community looks like. Even right, I think、mm-hmm. even even the representation is so、um, like stereotyped.、Um, yeah, yeah. And so I think it that's that's a part of it. And I I do think like I would I would like to think that genuine awareness of the real people and and their real thoughts and feelings and their real needs will help. With the change, you know, it's not the only thing, but I think that's what helped the change. And what we see now is, is a, a awareness of trans and non-binary people as as a political talking point,、mm-hmm. and that's not going to、mm-hmm. to help anybody. Yeah, it's like it's awareness of the trans youth suicides that are going on right now. No, one, there's no media that's talking、mm-hmm. about that、mm-hmm. apart from queer-owned media,、mm-hmm. and. That is the that is like the blood scandal、mm. of our time, and it's not being spoken about. It's awareness of the hate crime consistently、mm-hmm. every year. It's record-breaking levels of hate crime towards trans people. Yeah, I think that also one thing things that I would like these are some of the things I would like for people <laughs> to be aware of. I would like people to be aware that like we're all female in the womb、mm. first. I would like people to be aware of the fact that men also sometimes have to take testosterone and women sometimes have to take estrogen because of hormone levels changing with age, which is something that we all will need and all happens in all of us. I would like for people to be aware that having a gender-neutral bathroom. Does not mean that someone's coming up to you and looking at you in a certain way. Like I would like for people to be aware that like all of these crazy extraneous ideas of what transness is when it's alive and in a space, like don't make sense because there's. I think my favorite comparison. Sorry, I, I go on like little no, no, like side quests a lot. It's the neuro spiciness.、Like I think one of my favorite things that I read. I actually read it this morning while I was、um, boarding a, a flight. <laughs> I read, "No, not all men, but if you had a box of Maltesers and every two of those Maltesers was actually a rolled-up pebble of human, you would also be really careful, wouldn't you?" <laughs>、yeah. Right. So 
for me, I'm like, okay, so if you can if you can talk about that in that way for men, and like mm. let's also remember this would you rather be stuck in the woods with a bear or a man question. Mm. Oh, yes. And most people pick the bear, so would I. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think about that and you think about all of the like evils that we have in the world right now that come from like seemingly mm. not evil looking people. Mm -hmm. You also think that that's like just part of like the diversity of like human life and human nature, right? And with these, it's understanding that we treat these things with. It's with understanding that we we came to find out that there's so much more to being neurodivergent than just being like straight up autistic or having OCD or be uh, having ADHD. It's mm -hmm. with understanding that, um, oh my God, I want to remember his name perfectly, but I can't. But it's with understanding that this young doctor literally made a book that showed what people of color and their skin conditions look like because Prior to that, there were only two medical journals that actually had even examples of psoriasis mm. um, on black skin. Oh, and crazy. for me, babes, I literally went to my GP <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what's going on with my skin. And straight, straight up, this woman looked at me and said, it's herpes. And I took herpes medication for three months only to come back when she was on holiday and see a Nigerian doctor and him go, that's psoriasis. And see, like, it's mm. all it's just documenting mm -hmm. the different ways in which we can exist mm -hmm. right and i believe that if if all of the different media outlets and tv channels and all of that stuff mm -hmm. they, they they don't want to document it for us mm -hmm. i believe that like part of our revolution in changing the world is documenting every moment in every which way that we exist mm -hmm. from when we were mm -hmm. when i've documented from when i was like 13 and like going around as a cis gay man and like you know skinny jeans and white t-shirts with some converses no hate just facts <laughs> um right the way down to you know b b prancing around in ball gowns with like 52 inch long braids like we need to document it we need to put it out as well and the more we put it out the more our community supports us the more we are seen to be supported by our mm -hmm. own community who are also doing well in those spaces in which we don't have agency at the moment the more we can bring people to us i'm not saying that the onus is completely on us mm -hmm. i do not believe that the onus is completely on us it is actually terribly unfair mm -hmm. to be disrespected dehumanized marginalized pushed aside completely and then have to get up and be like yeah well i'm just gonna do all of this on my own um but i think we also have to show them that we're not going anywhere and all of the ways in which we are protesting and all of the we can diversify just as much as you have mm -hmm. we can we can switch it up just as much as you have and we can push forward just as much if not more than you have because we've had to hustle and struggle and be really fucking dynamic in all of the ways that we have to get around things mm -hmm. and all of the ways in which we had to get around things also helped all of y'all get the ways that you do your things now so put some respect on trans people's names also thank you that's just like <laughs> a little bit thank you <laughs> say that that was amazing thank you and it like it actually brought up some really interesting questions for me because obviously as a queer person but not a trans person i'm obviously like an ally and i do my best but none of us are perfect and i think it's very important that we hear from all of you how allies whether they be queer or not how they can create a safe and open and inclusive environment for their trans loved ones and even the trans strangers that they haven't met yet and i don't just mean within activism or within making change i mean within homes and friendship circles and hearths and creating safe spaces that people can be emotional and and brave and open how how can we best do that i think one thing i'd like to start with is that um I would like to think like trans liberation is for everybody mm. and the allies should know that mm. allies should feel in themselves and everyone who I talk to and I ask, you know, regardless of how they like identify um, in terms of their gender, I, if I ask them, what are some moments in your life where you felt like you couldn't do something or you had to do something because of your perceived gender, because of what society thought 
your gender should be like. Everyone has many stories. Um, and I think they need to start from that point. It is, I think, you know, Marty, you were saying earlier, it's not about victims we're trying to help. Um, it's about creating a world, I mean, you know, first, yeah, we have to, <laughs> these, these fundamental needs um, that, you know, we, we need to have to exist uh, for trans and non-binary people. But, you know, the bigger picture for everyone should be a world where everyone can be free to be themselves and express themselves and, and not be constrained by something that is quite arbitrary and has changed over, over the course of history. Um, and that everyone everyone suffers from um. yeah i yeah i think yeah to answer your question abby it's um it's about valuing empowerment right mm -hmm. individual empowerment and so it doesn't like take trans out of it everybody can resonate with that mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. to your point of you know we all want to show up in the world as ourselves and so that is what we're we're working towards mm -hmm. and so that, and that's a collective mission we all want that um so starting there and i i think the thing that i try to bring into conversations with about this this question in particular is is about listening to gender diverse people speaking to your friends and listening to them and just bringing them into um rooms that you are in um, is advocating for them in those rooms but it's not just it bringing them into the rooms because mm. there's a lot of um conversations in rooms where there's a lot of power mm. where trans people are not in those rooms and they're spoken about and no one's thinking oh should we should have a trans person in this room they're all thinking oh how do we accommodate for these trans people we need to mm. think about this or oh, well, you know we can't ask them because we're a bit scared we should know this you know <laughs> come on <Yeah>. like just <laughs> Bring me in the room. <laughs> yeah, and, literally. And yeah, you know, we're, I think we're infantilized mm. a lot as a, as a community. We know how, what we need and yeah. we know how to advocate for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially talking from this couch, you know, um, trans misogyny, mm. we talk about that. Um, I'm experiencing that a lot in a lot of different ways. Um, so, yeah, it's like, how do we dismantle that, right? And I think especially with um, with all women, we can kind of, we share that experience of misogyny, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. I think in smaller spaces, like in homes and stuff, um, trying to make space really, really is about listening and wanting to learn and wanting to understand. Mm -hmm. um, in... I, I would say switch out one of the TV programs you watch for listening to a trans podcast. Mm -hmm. And whether you're, it's not really about like, hey, I'm gonna listen to a trans podcast. You wanna come sit with me? Cause you know, <laughs> you're trans. Um, it's not really like that. It's more like, I, had, I have a friend um, who worked in diversity, equity, and inclusion for a while. And she always said, it's not normalizing because normalizing feels dirty. It's about usualizing, mm. making something usual, yeah, making like something best. that's mm. just like, like it's, mm. it flows easily, mm. right? Mm. So for me, what I like to do, especially when I'm in a room full of white people at home, <laughs> um, I have a couple of shows that I love to watch. Um, one is called Deconstructing Karen, um, and it's literally that fantastic. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's great because first everyone's talking, and this is the thing: you don't have to call everyone's attention to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Just have the voice on in the background because every so often someone is going to identify with something that is said, mm -hmm. and when they do, that's when the room hushes and listens, mm -hmm. and you're fostering an environment for conversation. If they only heard that one point, you could end up having a three hour long conversation based mm -hmm. on that one point and then moving on. So what I would say is if you're wanting to create more space in your home, in your friendship group, for your trans friend, partner, counterpart, whatever, 
start by actually just listening to the things that maybe they haven't even listened to about mm -hmm. themselves from other trans people because that gives you a little bit of an insight or an understanding just like oh i didn't i didn't realize that actually this could cause like serious dysphoria mm -hmm. i didn't realize that this could make you feel so uncomfortable in this way oh i didn't realize that like actually touching you in that place is like you know maybe i just want to like tickle you as a friend but like actually that's really triggering for you because mm. you know in some way shape or form that's maybe something that you feel uncomfortable with with your body because you feel dysphoric or at war with yourself or whatever you know all of that kind of stuff just listen and be open to listening and be open to learning and have fun with the learning yeah. mm. like have mm. fun with it it's yeah. not boring it's mm. not it's not terrible stuff like there are some really really incredible even catchphrases that you'll pick up from like mm -hmm. Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, as, you, as you're watching um, the death and life of Marsha P. Johnson on Netflix, or if you're watching How Do I Look, which I believe is the follow up to Paris is Burning that you can only find on like streaming channels mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, you know, there's so much that we are we are told that we should know about the world but how much of that do we actually use when was the last time you used pythagoras theorem mm -hmm. like well, i'm sure i learned pythagoras theorem. yeah i i don't even remember the formula but like yeah. there's all of these things that we're told to learn and we hold on to them like they are the essence of life we realize that they're completely not useful mm -hmm. and yet somehow we trick ourselves into still thinking no this is the way that it should be Babes, once you've realized that like 99.87% of the stuff that you learned, you're never going to use again, mm. you should kind of cotton on to the fact that like you've not been prepared for the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if there are other people who exist in the world that you were never prepared to encounter, that's not because they never existed. Mm. It's because they were systematically wiped out. Mm. White people didn't come to Africa to pay, take slaves. Mm. They came to Africa to take doctors and nurses and bankers and lawyers and philosophers and make them into slaves. Mm. So trans people, it's not that we've not existed. It's that we were pushed into the shadows so that we could be used for comedic mm. effect mm. or for dramatic effect or for horrific effect. I remember one of the scenes that stuck with me all my life was um, in Nip Tuck, I think it was Famke Janssen. I can't remember if she was the actress, but she was playing a trans woman. And this doctor who was played by the same guy who played Cole in Charmed, but I can't remember his real name because <laughs> I'm a Charmed fan. I don't care about the real man. Um, he started having sex with her and he like pulled out and like got really stiff and like was like, ugh, and stopped. Mm -hmm. And in a later scene, he explained that her vaginal canal was like only four inches deep. And, you know, because his endowment policy was like eight inches or whatever. Um, he knew that she was a trans woman and that he could. And I was like, mm. what? I mean, first of all, that's so gross on so many levels. Do you know what oh. I mean? But you see, and, and this is the thing, because you wouldn't talk about a cis woman's vaginal canal. No. Or whatever the term is mm. like that. Right. Because everybody's got one. Mm. And just like dicks vary in size. Vaginal canals vary in depth too. Mm. Yeah. So how can you tr how can you say that? You build up all of these things and you let them just go as fact without mm. actually educating anyone. It's up to it's up to us to educate ourselves. Mm. Mm. But if we talk about that as well, where why we have that lack of education, mm. right? I mean, and this idea that we can just comment on trans people's bodies when the media that we've consumed, which is the only way that we've really encountered mm. trans people. Mm. Um, you would have documentaries that are really focused on kind of a male to female mm -hmm. oh my God, yeah. transition, yeah. right? And it's very much like they are the subjects, we are kind mm -hmm. of dissecting them, we mm -hmm. are kind of, they're tragic. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is kind of the framing of, you know, Disclosure is a great documentary on Netflix. Mm -hmm. about, yes. Um, trans people and how they've been depicted in media over the years. But actually just looking into the UK and you're talking about education, what I find really interesting in creating Trans Plus History Week is that we didn't have that education around our community when we were growing up, right? Mm -hmm. I I went to school during Section 28. I know I don't look old enough. Um, and, you know, we. what was really interesting when I was researching about what we did learn in schools is um, in the 
in the early 90s in the UK, there was a law that was brought in place to respect um, a part of our history, which was the Holocaust. Mm. And so at Key Stage 3, that is the only legally mandated module to teach um, in history class uh, at secondary schools. Now that was brought in at the same time that Section 28 was in place, which meant that you couldn't teach about LGBT in schools. And so what that meant is that you had one law to respect a part of our education, while another law erased a part of it. Mm -hmm. And that meant that we didn't learn that the book burnings actually happened at the world's first trans clinic 91 years ago, May 6th this year. Um, so we lost lots of trans research, some you know really important research on medical transition in particular, because there was you know people that were um, undergoing medical transition back then. Um, Dora Richter was the first person to actually have a vaginoplasty, and was somebody that lived at that institute. So, you know, I remember seeing photos of those book burnings and not being taught about what books that were being actually burned there. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really important that we actually now do this education because the people that were denied that education, like myself, are now in places of power mm -hmm. and have this idea in, there's this idea that we don't exist, we've never mm -hmm. existed, you know, we are a trend, a social contagion even, you know, really dehumanizing language. Mm -hmm. And I like to be compassionate when I'm feeling good and hopeful <laughs> that it's because we were denied the education mm -hmm. I myself as a trans person didn't get that education. Mm. I want our trans community to learn mm. our history because our history, it, learning our history is a radical thing to do when it's been denied you. Mm. And it is the key to our liberation for ourselves and for others mm. to learn it. And so I think that's be compassionate to people that of course they don't know our history. Of course they don't know that we've always been here. We were all denied it. We were mm. all denied that fact and surely when you realize that you've been denied something, your your want is to learn about it actually, because you've been denied the full picture. And why would you not? As intelligent, smart, creative people, why would you not want to fill those gaps in your knowledge? Mm -hmm. I always want to do that. Yeah. So yeah. And I guess just personally from your perspective with Trans Plus History Week, what was sort of your, what was the response that you got when you were sort of bringing up the like lack of education and these new resources and things like that? Um, the response from the response from the trans community was interesting, actually, from trans um, leaders in our community um, was, you know, I, I was um, consulting with the community to, um, you know, if you're if you're going to try and bring in a new queer, you know, calendar week into globally into the calendar, I mean, number one, your ego has got to be off the scale. But <laughs> <laughs> but like you have to consult the community because is it something that the community wants? I mean, I had a very clear idea about why we needed it, but is it something that's going to be adopted? And so I spoke to a lot of people before announcing it and launching it. And some of the things that I would get from trans community leaders were, how are you going to fill a week? Which <laughs> it really, really illuminates how little we've mm. learned our own history and mm. been afforded that space to learn our own history and have it advocated and mm. shared with us. Um, so that was really the reaction from the trans community as, mm. from a focus from that point of view. But when I actually shared, um, when I share the Nazi story, a lot of people don't know. And when I'm speaking to the ERGs, the employee mm -hmm. resource groups um, at corporates, because I'm developing sponsorship around it, mm -hmm. that is the thing that really resonates. That's the powerful thing that they just did not know. And they are surprised that they are, you know, in their 40s and they just mm -hmm. didn't know, know this mm -hmm. piece. And they remember that photo, especially if we're talking to people in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really keen to know and they're really keen to get involved and it really emotionally connects people to the idea that getting really geeky about history is something really important that we all do. Mm. And we were talking about um, before about how to engage people. Mm. For me, like Antiques Roadshow is a universal thing that people, my, my partner won't, won't agree, but I love <laughs> Antiques Roadshow. I love Antiques Roadshow. I love Antiques Roadshow, Roadshow. it's amazing. Yeah. You know, a Fiona Bruce moment, who, who doesn't love that? So I just love getting geeky about history. Mm. And I feel like it can be this universal gateway into education. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so it's a sneaky way in, to, <laughs> rather than being like, okay, sit down, we're going to do Gender 101. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Not again. Like, but you know, this is a really nice way in. Mm -hmm. Our interesting stories told by trans people mm -hmm. as well. That's 
that's critical. We've mm -hmm. invested and paid trans writers, trans mm -hmm. artists, trans audio producers mm -hmm. to write these stories, like mm -hmm. reflect on our history. What can we learn from our history? Back to agency, you know, having Trans History Week as a CIC, a not-for-profit, mm -hmm. which is now, you know, like you've got the CIC. Mm -hmm. It's it's really important to me that it's trans-owned, trans-led, we pay trans people, we invest in them and their futures. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's two things I want to say about that. One is like part of trans history is also about how colonial powers imposed mm -hmm. like what we consider to be the, the like the standard gender norms. Well, we today. call it traditional. And yes, it's exactly. It's not no. traditional. <laughs> and like, for example, in a Chinese family of languages, um, like I speak Mandarin and Cantonese, there were no gendered pronouns mm -hmm. until after mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, the opening up to the West, and and then you know, even in in spoken in most spoken um, Chinese languages, it doesn't exist. But in in writing. Now it does because mm. at that point they were like, okay, well, I guess we need to to meet with the times, and there's probably some pressure too. So mm. um, there was that the, the gender binary was imposed on on so many groups um, and cultures. So I think that's an important thing for people to learn about the culture. And and when I talk to people who do speak, you know, a Chinese language, they don't they don't know that they they just take for granted that pronouns must be like this way, and and and, and they're you know, m kind of even making fun of of like neo pronouns in in English because they're like that's weird, and I'm like, these are neo pronouns in, in Chinese that you're using every day. Mm -hmm. um, and they were just neo like 50 years ago or or something like that. Don't quote me on a number. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yeah. one of those things that over 50 percent of the languages that have mm -hmm. ever existed do not contain gendered pronouns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's the majority. Yeah. Of how we have talked about each other and in relation to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing I just want to quickly touch on was that I think we're, you know, if we're talking about allies and um, how they can show up for us, mm. um, I think what you said was really resonated that that trans and non-binary people don't know our own histories mm -hmm. and w because we were denied it because there was no way to to find out mm -hmm. um and i think it does things to us right it, it, we have all these internalized ideas i also have my my first moment of um like first moment of encountering a trans character in in in, in popular culture it was it was ace ventura that jim carrey mm -hmm. movie from ages ago and it's seared in my brain and I'm, I'm sure it's uh it's affecting how i think about myself and and how i you know what dangers i face in a world um and how i yeah how i feel comfortable presenting and all of these things are are inside us and um i think sometimes people want you as a trans and non-binary person to to show up with the answers to show up feeling confident mm -hmm. that coming out is like great give me the whole package of the story mm -hmm. of who you want to be and how you want to be and what we should call you and everything great I'll, i'm going to take that and and go mm -hmm. um and work with it and that's not how it is and i i think that's it's a very um like unpacking all of these internalized trans transphobic ideas mm -hmm. and packing all of these norms inside ourselves is is hard um, yeah. it takes time it's a process people changing you know what pronoun they use is not being flippant or being fickle mm. it is them finding their way out of all of these confines that exist for everyone um and it's hard mm. yeah I do want to say actually to that point and to the question you said before about how do people respond because mm -hmm. you've made me ref reflect on mm -hmm. the really important element of this which is that the way allies or cis people have responded to Trans History Week is that they believe it's for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really interesting. It's another thing trans people are doing in service to cis people. Mm. Yeah. It's not. It's not for them. No. It's for trans people. It's for tra telling trans people you exist. You, you exist. Mm. You've always mm -hmm. existed. Mm -hmm. You are mm. heirs to a millennia old people with rich cultures. Mm. You belong and you've always been here and you belong here in 2024 when it seems like everybody is telling you that you do not belong. Mm. You absolutely do belong. Mm. Um, so it's for trans people first and foremost. 
it's really hard actually to to get that across to cis people a lot especially when i'm talking to lgbt networks they assume it's for them they assume it's for the company it's but mm, it's mm. Are we gonna, when are we going to talk about pronouns and how you use them <laughs> like, i mean i have to do that to get the money get the sponsorship like, <laughs> it really isn't for the them it really mm. isn't for them mm. I, I think it's very interesting that you sort of said that e even within a space that you've created for your own community there are still people sort of trying to elbow their way in a little bit and say okay but how does this reflect on us mm. how can we yeah you know shove our mm. way into yeah, it yeah this is a vehicle to create allyship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean it can do that and yes i do talk about that as well mm. but primarily it's for trans people yeah. to mm. feel they belong it's for trans youth at the scouts mm -hmm. club that is doing a book club mm -hmm. about trans history to feel like they belong and so that they, their suicidal ideation isn't as strong. I am aware that we are, <laughs> we, I've just been happily listening to you talk, great. <laughs> I'm really enjoying myself, um, but we are sort of coming to the end of our time. Mm -hmm. So I'd just really quickly like to um, give space for you guys to kind of mention any particular um, organization or activists or people that you think are doing amazing work, creating safe spaces for trans people and making mm. the world a more trans inclusive place. Uh, just, I guess, is like a little resource dump for the people watching um, just before we close. Mm. I know, I'm just sort of <laughs> well. yeah. Obviously you are allowed to just like- Can I just name, plug? Drop yourself. Yeah, yeah. Plug. Yeah. Do it. So Trans Plus History Week, it's a CIC, so it's a not-for-profit. And we exist to uplift trans plus creative talent, tell trans history stories, and then also create events that um, instill well being and share those histories. Um, so please do support Trans Plus History Week. Um, in terms of pers personal um, connections, people that I think we should celebrate, Nancy Kelly of Diva um, is an amazing ally, the model of an ally, and does so much. Um, advocating for us. Uh, Julian Moyne as well from the Good Law Project. Um, Jude Guatamaki, who's the founder of Trans Plus Solidarity Alliance. Um, Danny Anson Jones, Not A Phase. Transactual, you should support. Mm -hmm. A lot of these organizations are trans led. Back to agency and the mm -hmm. point, that's like, invest in our trans community leaders. Absolutely. And where do we learn more about Trans Plus, trans plus History Week and oh. support it? Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we'll go on to Instagram. Everyone's on Instagram now. Mm -hmm. Trans History Week on Instagram. And that's the best place to find us or Queer AF. Um, so if you just type that into Google, you'll find us on there because um, we work very closely with Queer AF CIC and Jamie Wareham runs that. And it's a really good CIC mm -hmm. independent publisher that is covering all of the things that we need to talk about. Wonderful, right now. wonderful mm -hmm. publication. Yes. You ready? Oh my <laughs> god. Okay, so like high key, I actually need I need my phone to be able to do that. <clears throat> We're on it. We're on it. Okay, We're I actually need it. my phone. I'm sorry. Okay. I'll, so I'll do you it. go first. Go on yeah. it. Save us. Um I, I I was also gonna plug transactual. I think mm -hmm. they're do doing great work. They are currently doing legal work around um the um Puberty. Yeah, the, the puberty blocker mm -hmm. block. I was trying to figure out how to phrase it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a yeah, three month ban yes. on the puberty blocker that's being challenged. Yeah. Um, and and I think just a great resource yeah, again to to learn about um, the issues that actually matter there um, from people who are trans, non-binary, um, and you know allies and organization as well who are deeply um, you know involved understanding and and following the lead of trans and non-binary people um one or one other organization i would plug um is is london friend it's the it's the oldest um mm -hmm. lgbt um organization in the uk and i'm i'm gonna plug them partly because that's where i first went when i arrived in in london i went to a um twice a month meetup group called tea on tuesday and yeah, I think, you know, belonging, whether it's knowing you belong in a course of history um, across time and across peoples or belonging in, in finding a space where you can just ask, mm. you know, the most basic questions or share stories that I can, I can tell that they have 
you know, people in the room and myself included have no one else to ask these questions to or mm. to to share their stories to and, mm. and not get a million questions from well-intentioned people potentially, but people who have no um, frame of reference and um, for them it's a story, mm. right? Not um, um, not about your experience and and how you feel. So um, you know, certainly that's not the only one. There are a lot of great meetup groups, but. Um, it holds That's a special great. place in my heart. Of course, mm-hmm. that is a great one. And Gendered Intelligence, is another trans mm-hmm. organization yes. that does a lot of that. Yes, um, yes. Community groups as well. So another, another trans org. Okay, right. So I'm going with <laughs> voices because lately I, I enjoy following trans organizations. I enjoy seeing everything they put out, but I'm really, really, really enjoying actually hearing what people have to say about their transness and how that affects how they move through the world and how that maybe intersects with their neurodivergency or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, the first person that I would say definitely give a follow on Instagram is Discover Bam Bam. Um, She is a beautiful, wonderful, deep thinking trans woman who's also an incredible performer and a house mother. Um, on the on the ballroom scene so you will get an insight into many different areas Mm -hmm. of queerness and how queerness can look and be and feel um she speaks so truthfully about her experience that you can't help but like stop and really like read and reread and get goosebumps sometimes um i would also say that I really enjoy, not it's not specifically trans, but um, Glass House um, on Instagram. That is, it's well, they're on Instagram, but they're also actually a physical space, a community mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. Um, queer people of color, trans people, non-binary people. It's it's a space for the community. Mm, I've not heard of this. Yes. Oh my God. It's li- uh, that makes me happy. <laughs> um, it's um, it's. Like it's it's was the Common Press and Glass House mm. okay. run by Aisha Sh- Aisha Shaibu, um, who is also part of UK Black Pride. Oh yeah, so I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have so many events on all the time that bring community together, that help us to understand one another, connect more with one another. They also have a queer bookshop upstairs mm. that does like uh, drag queen story time. You know, so you can bring your kids and teach them that being <laughs> queer is great too. Um, is this yeah. different to Common Press then, or is it the same place? So Glass House is the downstairs space, which oh, also, and they also have like incredible resources for queer people to come and use, including like recording studios, like all of this stuff, oh, right? Okay. So if you want to be an ally to a queer person who wants to create, um, mm-hmm. who wants to do something, who wants to connect with other queer people, Take them to something at Glass House or the Common Press. If you want to do some learning about how your, how cisness engages with transness and sometimes affects it Mm. or shapes it or changes it, definitely tune in, follow, subscribe, support, Venmo, PayPal, Discover (laughs) Bam Bam. She's giving so much knowledge (laughs) all of the time. Um... Yeah, I mean, th- those are the, those are the two things that come to mind straight away right now, because it's one a place where people can converge, and two someone who I genuinely feel is a voice for the people. Also, follow Dark World. Oh yeah, yes. follow me too. Please but like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Little self plug. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, you guys. It has been a real honor and a privilege to sit here and listen to you guys talk. Um, yeah, it has been just wonderful to hear you guys speaking. Um, and thank you so much for joining us, especially on such late notice for some of you. <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you everybody for watching as well. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Thank you.